I see there's a wide audience, lots of clinicians on the line, unsurprisingly. Um, and we'll all have seen in the invitation that Dr. King is medical advisor at DVLA in Swansea. Um, you've been panel secretary to Secretary of State's Honorary Advisory Panel on Driving and Mental Health. And before that, you were a psychiatrist, a forensic psychiatrist. So thank you very much for making the time to speak to us today. Dr. King, um, can I hand over to you? Oh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the introduction and um, thank you for the invitation to, to join you this, uh, this afternoon. As I said, I, I'm one of the um, the medical advisors uh, down at DVLA in, in Swansea. Um, so I, I thought what I'd try and cover today is just some of the aspects around driving and, and licensing with, with, with various mental health conditions. I thought what I do is just talk a little bit about the various sort of legal framework and, and licenses that, um, that govern our decisions really, and then talk a little bit about the, the various standards that exist for the mental health conditions. And then also just a bit of information about where you can get some advice from us um, if, you, if you need that. Uh, and also just about notifications to DVNA as well. So I'm sure all of you are aware of what DVLA does and what it is. Um, it's part of the Department for Transport. Um, it holds a huge volume of data in DVLA, so over 48 million records about drivers, but also records um, around vehicles as well, and also is responsible for collecting your vehicle excise duty, your car tax, um, on, uh, for, as well on behalf of the government. It's of course based uh, in Swansea and has quite a large workforce in the area. Just in the driver's medical bit, which is the section of DVLA that handles um, licenses for drivers who have medical conditions, um, there's one senior doctor and there's about 34, 34 doctors, um, uh, nine nurses and um, a larger volume of, of clerical staff. So mo most of the work is handled by clerical staff. We only tend to see the more complex of, of cases. Um, and we are, of course, totally dependent on reports. So we're not able to examine any drivers ourselves um, in Swansea. We're dependent on reports that we get from a wide range um, of sources. But clearly, mostly it's, it's from clinicians that, that we get those reports from. Um, so we, we handle around 800,000 decisions a year. Uh, as I said, most cases are dealt with by the clerks and they follow operating instructions that have been written by, by the medical staff there. Um, and m most of what we do is issue licenses. So you might, you might think that we mostly take licenses away, um, but mostly we are issuing licenses and it's very much trying to do what we can to make sure people um, can continue driving. So just to first about um, the actual licenses themselves, so you often will hear um, and the standards themselves refer to both group one and group two licenses. So we talk about group one licenses and this refers to your general car license and motorcycle licenses. So this is a license that most people will have. Uh, and then we talk about group two licenses and this, this really applies to the professional drivers. So those lorry HGV drivers and bus drivers and the group two licenses have a higher standard of, um, of have a higher medical standard than group one. And that's around linked to really the time spent driving and also the, the potential danger that there is from having an accident with a, with a group two vehicle. Um, and it's going to be anywhere from someone driving a minibus up to some of those very large articulated lorries that you might see uh, driving around. And, and obviously, as we know, um, you when you apply for a driving license, you first get a provisional license. You then have to undertake the driving tests that are that re are required, and you'll then get a, a full license. And that license for Group One is valid until age seventy. And at age seventy, you have to renew your license then. Um, every three years, but there's no automatic review of medical conditions. So it's very much dependent on the driver declaring 
conditions to DVLA um, rather than us actively investigating people. Um, there's also this um, peculiarity so that if you if you did pass your driving test prior to 1st of January 97, you have what's called implied entitlements as part of your car license and um, which allow you to drive larger vehicles and also minibuses as well. But the law around that's quite complex, but we, we don't tend to look at that until somebody becomes uh, age 70. So when we look at the actual driving standards, um, there's a number of ways in which we we've, which we get the standards. So primarily, um, they are guided by legislation, and that's both UK legislation um, and EU legislation um, as well. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. And the second way in which driving standards are set are from the Secretary of State's um, Secretary of State for Transport's honorary medical advisory panels. And this is perhaps more relevant in the area of mental health, where there are less standards written in legislation and more guidance from the panel, really. So there are six panels that exist. Um, they cover cardiology, neurology, uh, mental health, alcohol and drugs, uh, diabetes and vision. And each panel has a number of um, uh, experts in the field and also has lay member representation as well. The panels tend to meet twice a year and what they will do is review uh, review the medical standards uh, at each time they meet and look at any emerging evidence or statistics um, and review the standards and set them as needed. We also often refer cases up to the panel so if they're quite difficult cases or cases where there's not really a particular standard to apply to that case we often will seek the advice from the panel to get some direction on where we think um, what we think we might need to apply in, in that case. And DVLA quite regularly advertises for people to join the panels as well. So there was a re recent recruitment round um, uh, for that as well. So the legal framework, the, the legislation primarily gives DVLA responsibility to make sure that license holders are of course safe to drive. Um, so the work is guided by the primary UK legislation, which is the Road Traffic Act, uh, and then the three EU directives. And those directives have been brought into UK legislation through these various regulations and amendments um, that have, have taken place. And the reason for that is that allows then people who hold a UK license to be able to drive uh, within the EU. But I won't get into um, the situation post uh, Brexit on that one at the moment. <laughs> Um, so the Road Traffic Act requires drivers or applicants for a license to notify or tell a DVLA about the condition that, the, that may affect driving. So, so in the UK, the emphasis very much is on drivers being required to notify us that they have a medical condition. And that then gives DVLA the right to investigate uh, that license holder. We can ask people to attend an examination and also gives us the right then to refuse or revoke a license depending on, on that condition. But also we can issue more shorter term licenses. So if there's a condition that we feel um, might change within a period of time or something that we need to review, we can issue um, shorter term licenses. So normally one, two or three year licenses, some conditions um, like epilepsy, we might issue a five year license. Or also we can decide that, well, they don't, we don't really think this is a condition that needs to be reviewed again, and we will restore um, a full license to age 70. And the legislation also defines um, the terms relevant and prospective disabilities. So in, in the context of driver licensing, a relevant disability is, is defined as any medical condition that could be a source of danger to the public when driving. And a prospective disability is a condition that um, might in the future be a source of danger, a likely source of danger to the public when driving. So that really guides when we're thinking about our legal framework in terms of operating. We, we have to, as medical advisors, define what we would think the relevant disability is in that case. And all drivers, if we revoke or refuse someone's license, they have a right to appeal that decision and those cases are then that appeal is handled by the magistrates court um, and they have a right to do that. 
So what the regulations then do is, is um, define a couple of medical conditions. So there's not very much um, detail around that, but they do define a couple of medical conditions specifically in legislation. Um, and those are epilepsy and severe mental disorder and the persistent misuse of alcohol and drugs is also defined in law as well. So when we think about things like epilepsy, epilepsy gives a firm guideline to us to say that if you have a seizure, if you have a one an isolated seizure, you have to be off the road for six months. If you have multiple seizures, it's 12 months. And that's actually written in the legislation. With, with severe mental disorder, it's more a sort of general statement around what, what that includes. So it doesn't particularly guide us to what we should do in such cases, but it, it gives gives an idea. So it's similar to the um, the Mental Health Act, the 1983 Act, really, in, in terms of its definition, I suppose. So when we actually look at this, the, the mental health standards themselves, I mean, generally, drivers who are sort of at the opposite end of each, each spectrum are fairly straightforward to deal with. So if somebody is very stable and well for, uh, from their condition, then generally, um, there's there's no issue with with those individuals continuing to drive, and often we will just be restoring their full license to those individuals. And clearly, drivers who are quite acutely unwell are normally not going to be fit to drive. Um, and it is perhaps the in between where things can be more difficult. And as I said before, majority the assessment really is is the combination of of what the driver declares to us but also the clinical reports that we receive. So whether that is the forms that you get sent out to complete, um, and also we, we often request medical notes to, to review those as well. And we can arrange practical assessment. And I'll talk a bit, a bit more about that when I talk about the sort of cognitive impairment aspects. And ultimately the question we have to answer is, is the condition likely to cause the patient to be a source of danger when driving? Um, and there are a couple of things that guide that. So the panel a couple of years ago did looked at some of the literature around driving and mental health conditions. And there isn't really much around. I've put this reference in, which is kind of the main review really that's looked, uh, looked at all the evidence with particular mental health conditions and driving. Um, and really the conclusion of that review was that there is a small amount of literature in that area and that more um, longer sort of larger scale longitudinal studies are needed to have a look at the effects of different conditions on driving. So what we really rely on in, in guiding our standards is the opinion, the expert opinion of our panel. Um, and they will do that in reviewing a number of ways in which conditions can affect driving. So when we think about driving skills, there's a number of skills that are clearly identified in evidence that, that are important for driving. So when we think about mental health conditions and, and cognition, um, aside from being able to physically be, being able to drive a car, there's a number of things that sort of spring to mind. So things like attention, concentration, memory and planning, insight um, is, is quite important and judgment and adaptability. Those are kind of the main areas. So when we look at any condition, with relation to driving, we're thinking about how the, either the pattern of symptoms or the particular way in which the individual presents in that case, how, how it, that pattern might affect some of these skills. And this is really what the, the forms and the evidence we're trying to gather are trying to, um, trying to ascertain. So that's, that's the main way. In the absence of any firm literature that describes the condition, th this is really how we think Think about these cases. So just thinking about a couple of the common uh, conditions really. So with anxiety and depression, I mean we get a lot of notifications around this area and um, mostly they are um, largely primary care level managed, um, managed drivers. So really you know, that uncomplicated illness um, managed in primary care is not really something particularly interested in. What we're more interested in is the more severe episodes so where there are significant um, biological symptoms um, affecting cognition and active suicidal ideation but particularly where there might have been a car involved or, or, or something like that and people who've required secondary care 
um, intervention. So for us of group one drivers, a car, it's generally having a, a, a sort of period of stability and, and good recovery and and generally about a three month period we'd apply for that to see some stability over that time. Cases of individuals who've had ECT, then again, it really depends on the, the effects. And that's not necessarily a bar to ongoing driving and seizures related to ECT are exempted from the epilepsy regulations. So we don't we don't apply those um, because they're considered as provoked seizures. With group two drivers, it's more around a bit of a longer period of stability to make sure that that recovery is sustained. Um, and we're always looking at making sure there's no severe side effects from medication as well. Uh, and so just reflecting on those things I mentioned about driving skills, these are perhaps some of the areas where you'd think there's more of a higher risk with driving. So where there's any difficulties with concentration, um, impairment in memory, agitation that might be distracting to the driver, active suicidal ideation. But again, that tends, we tend to focus that more on if there's any particular ideation around driving. So any, any thoughts about driving, you know, committing suicide with a, using a car um, and any behavioral disturbances, so aggression. Um, and I was thinking about any side effects. So any, um, sort of uh, drowsiness, those kind of symptoms really that might impact um, on the driving. Um, next would be um, acute psychosis, but the, the, the standard is also encompasses uh, bipolar disorder. So episodes of mania or hypomania. Um, so you notice a pattern here in terms of the group one. So again, it's, it's a sort of a three month um, period of stability is needed. Um, and an emphasis that definitely during any acute episode that the, the individual shouldn't be driving and they must always tell us about these conditions. Um, we need to have see some uh, regained insight, uh, adherence to the treatment plan and making sure there's no side effects from uh, medication that might impair driving. And with group two, it's tightened up a little bit. So we look for a 12 month period of stability and generally, we, we like to see more specialist uh, reports to, to, to review these cases. Um, and again, the, the emphasis there on, on looking at does any side effects from, from medication. Um, there is this caveat in the guidance. So the, the panel considered somebody to be unstable if there'd been four or more episodes in the previous 12 months. In terms of um, in terms of mood swings, so that then make makes makes the time six months rather than rather than the three months uh, time. But there's a specific question around that on the on on the forms that we gain information from. Um, with the more chronic uh, psychosis disorder, so things things like schizophrenia, schizophrenia, uh, delusional disorders, then the same applies in group one. But we, we do recognise that sometimes people might have ongoing symptoms. So there might be ongoing delusions or hallucinations, but they might not necessarily be causing a problem with driving. Um, so clearly, if there are things focused around driving, uh, other road users, then that's a red flag to us. Um, but for group one drivers, if there are delusions or ongoing symptoms that either the, the hallucinations are not causing any distraction to the, to, to the individual uh, or the delusions are really not relevant to driving um, and the things like memory concentration are okay then we would allow a license to be issued in a group one for, for that driver clearly with support from clinicians in that in that case um, Group two, that doesn't really apply. It's uh, it's a more stringent, so needing that firm's 12 months of stability with good engagement and support to gain uh, from clinicians around that and, and the need to regain insight in that, in those cases. And usually would be an annual license for a, for a good couple of years to make sure that that stability is maintained. Um, and there, there's some extra um, requirements around group two. So in, in terms of thinking about side effects is making sure that it's a minimum, the minimum effective dose you know, in line with any good practice, but making sure that there are not any 
deficits um, and we think about uh, things that affect driving such as concentration but also any motor uh, manifestations uh, with, with antipsychotics as well is really important um, and there may be times when someone has they might be stable but there are indicators around you know a likelihood or more frequent relapses that that we would um, be thinking about that as well um, the panel have recently had a, a look again at some of the neurodevelopmental conditions. Um, so, so previously, um, these were all, all sort of notifiable on diagnosis to DVLA. That's changed now in, in terms of looking at how these often present. Um, and we're now really only requiring notification if there is any, any past the condition that's likely to affect driving. So you know, the, the sorts of things the panel consider were again things like concentration, tension, difficulties in memory and obviously any behaviours um, and emotional regulation. Th those kind of elements are quite important uh, aspects of driving and generally if, if, if individuals such as these have, have already passed a driving test then it's likely that um, you know particularly with um, individuals with autism with their autistic spectrum disorders that they'll that you know, that that will not be something that that changes but clearly if there's been a change in the condition then then we would need to know about that and again you know looking at the side effects of any medication or or how that medication itself might impact on driving is also quite important um the same really applies with um cases of learning disability as well so um it's often the first step is, is somebody applying for a provisional license um, and again, it's recognised that individuals have to pass you know, quite a multi-stage driving test now to, to gain a licence. And often we will take the view that unless there's a severe uh, difficulty, then the driving test really should decide on, on their fitness to, to be able to drive. Because, of course, when people are learning, learning to drive, they will have to have someone sitting with them. Often that will be a driving instructor who has dual control. So um, that, that's, that's important for us to, to, to remember that. Um, other conditions we might come across, so eating disorders, um, we, we do have notifications around that. Um, generally with eating disorders, it's, um, it's around any, any symptoms or side effects that, that come with that. So any weakness in ability to control a car, uh, any problems with, um, with blackouts or loss of consciousness. Um, we're not prescriptive around around any sort of BMI levels, but you know, again, looking for this around this sort of three months of stability really before um, before we we're, we're happy to license in the, in those cases. But again, it's looking at the individual case as well. Uh, the same really with uh, non epileptic seizure disorder. So um, again, having a three month period of not having any events uh, is important. Um, although, you know, we often see these coming through neurology, um, you know, somebody notifying us of a seizure that later sort of turns out to, to be more non-epileptic in nature. Um, I'm, I thought I'd cover some of the uh, alcohol misuse and dependence because it often it's, it's relevant in these cases. This again has been something that the alcohol and drugs panel have recently reviewed the evidence and, and updated the standard. So in uh, it, it's really the, the standards the same for both group one and group two. It's just sort of the time frames that vary here. Um, so in, in cases of alcohol dependence, we now require a complete abstinence from alcohol at each renewal. So you'd need 12 months of abstinence at each renewal to be eligible for a license. And we are generally applying that now for a five year period before we will um, issue a more long term license. Um, we use the uh, carbohydrate deficient transferring test, a DVLA, to, um, to, to look for compliance and, and the blood parameters around that. Um, and that, that abstinence is, is an absolute, so um, there has to be no alcohol intake. I mean, maybe we would accept so, sort of, you know, one or two units on a special occasion once a year, but other than that, uh, it has to be absolute abstinence from alcohol. With, mis with alcohol misuse, uh, it's a, a smaller period of time, so six months. Um, and what the panel said with that, they, they are happy with somebody controlling their drinking 
within the government guidelines. So that's 14 units a week at the moment. Um, and with group two, it's the same standard, but it's just longer. So three years for the dependents and then 12 months for the misuse side. Um, drug misuse and dependence, it, it just depends on the type of drug that's being used. So these vary from six months to 12 months um, of control. Um, so, and we obviously getting a lot more notifications around novel psychoactive substances. The, these can be difficult to, um, to categorize. So it, it, you know, again, it depends on the, the effects that they produce. Um, and we would normally undertake urine testing uh, in these cases, um, and uh, that that's that's commissioned by DVLA. Uh, a group two is again, it's just a longer period of time, so we've got a twelve months and three years rather than the six and twelve months. Um, and there are specific standards in place for drivers who are methadone or, or subutex treatment as part of a treatment program. Um, that that needs to be complied with, and these are these are written in the um, the medical standards. So we we look for this uh, e each time that individual applies for their license. Um, something that uh, you know it, that that often causes particular problems is cases around cognitive impairment and dementia. So we we found and studies find that driving is a very learned habits. So there's a lot of um, residual learning around. Driving. So, the when when you look at uh, where we've done sort of studies, looking at scoring on psychometric testing, um, and driving performance is often a really poor correlation. So, somebody who has a very low score on testing doesn't necessarily uh, do very badly at driving. They might still have quite good function uh, in terms of their driving ability. And, and the same is obviously true. So somebody who has only a small, you know, smaller impairment can also then have a bad, a bad score in their driving. Um, sometimes it can be difficult to, you know, pick apart whether that's due to just poor driving practice or whether there is, um, whether it's been caused by the cognitive impairment. We very much rely on our, um, on the assessment teams to try and pick that out when, when they do the reports. Um, and even the practical assessment itself, there haven't really been any studies validating how how those how results in those practical assessments of driving actually translate into um, in terms of accident statistics and looking at how well they predict people's driving behaviour. But but it's really the only tool um, that we have um, at the moment. So in, in terms of a uh, someone with just mild cognitive impairment. Um, they can, you know, if there's no, if there's no significant impairment in function, they will generally um, be okay to have a longer term license. Um, individuals with dementia will only ever get a group, a one year license of group one. And at the moment, it's a complete bar to having, holding a group two license. So when somebody notifies us of the diagnosis, they will automatically lose their group two entitlement. Um, some of the high risk factors that the, that have been identified are, are, are individuals where there's really significant memory impairment. So whether that's sufficient enough to cause he hesitancy in terms of perhaps remembering where you're where you're driving to or um, what the purpose, and you often will see that in in driving assessments. Um, and maybe a more obvious sign of the sort of overall decline. And we are increasingly having individuals notified to us by the police. So the police will, will send notifications to DVLA if they've been involved in, in some sort of incident and they have concerns around a, a person's driving. And we might see a notifications that you know look like somebody reporting to police that they've lost their car in a car park, they can't find their car, or they're not sure where they've parked it, or they can't remember where they are. Um, we do get an increasingly number of those notifications, and then often not individuals who've had any uh, contact with, with services or any assessment in the past. Um, lack of insight is quite important um, because that, that can um, be dangerous in terms of not being able to appreciate dangers on the road or, or appreciate impaired performance. Um, and obviously any personality changes around uh, risk taking and impulsive behaviour. Um, but again, the sort of questions that are relevant for us 
or really is there any sufficient memory impairment um, that disrupt the activities? Uh, is there any loss of judgment um, and any inappropriate behavior? Um, and so for us often, um, they in assessing these individuals, the, the, how, how the, the information that's presented to us in terms of um, the pattern of impairment that they have will, will guide us in that answer. And we, we often will commission um, a driving assessment to have a look at, and see how they, how they perform on the road. Um, and we can commission that. Obviously, clinicians can also request driving assessments and often we, we get that uh, sent through to us, which, is, which is, can be really helpful um, in, in being able to evaluate the, those individuals. Um, something else that we, we get asked about quite frequently is compulsory admissions under the Mental Health Act. Um, so the general principle is that, that we, we, the standards should be achieved outside of a hospital setting. Um, but you know, in general principles, if an individual is, is subject, you know, particularly in the acute phase, then they're probably not going to meet um, meet the standards by nature of the medical condition that they are under the, the section for. Um, but really with patients who are on longer term sections who've probably been stable for some time would probably meet the medical standards, then it's really having an individual discussion and assessment of those individuals. Um, and they can be licensed, you know, even, if, even with ongoing um, if it's subject to the Mental Health Act in longer term, if that's part of the sort of the treatment plan and recovery plan. Um, and it, it's always worth having a discussion about, about those kind of patients. Um, I thought I'd just cover notifications to DVLA. Um, so as I mentioned, obviously, the, the drivers themselves have the, have the obligation in law to inform DVLA of any relevant um, changes in their health or any conditions um, that affect driving, but obviously doctors also have have an obligation to ensure that patients are aware of that uh, and advise them that they should notify DVLA. Um, and there are ways in which um, if either patient's capable or not willing to inform DVLA that, that you can break that confidentiality and inform um, DVLA. And there's some quite good guidance from the GMC and also from DVLA around how to go about that um, and, and how to actually make that uh, notification. And I always advise people to discuss with their indemnity bodies well, as well the case just to ensure um, that, that, uh, that the advice is being followed. Um, but you know, we, we, we do act on notifications that are made to us uh, to investigate. So sometimes um, some of those notifications will be with, with consent. So uh, a patient may ask, may ask you to notify us on their behalf which is also perfectly fine um, and you can always um, you can always contact us to ask or discuss anon having an anonymous discussion um, about a case uh, you know, don't have to give us any details to to get some advice and see what we would advise in in that case and, that, and that's fine and the guidance also sets out a process really around you know giving giving the license holder time to a time period to make sure but then giving them a, a sort of you know an ultimatum to make sure that they notify um and keeping them informed of that um where you can find information well there's the assessing fitness to drive document which is available uh, online on the gov.uk website this is updated probably around twice a year so um, you can you can also on there sign up to email notifications to to tell you when that document's updated. But that has all the medical standards uh, written in it. Um, we also have um, a telephone and email line. So at the moment, with the um, pandemic, the telephone line isn't operating, um, but the email is. So if um, if you need to get in touch with us, you can send in an email and you'll get a response. Usually the same day. Uh, to that email. Um, so that, that's really the end of the, the presentation I had, um, just obviously to allow some time for any questions now. Um, and I'll leave the, um, those contact details up um, as well, should anyone uh, want to jot those down in case you want to get in touch with us. So yeah, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. King. That was really interesting. Um, I can see that there are a number of questions already. Um, 
uh, Naeem, I think yours was first and then Ulrich. So would you like to call it out? Thanks, uh, Dr. King. That's a uh, very, um, very clear and great talk. I really enjoyed that. And thanks for uh, giving, the uh, giving the talk as well. Um, I mean, in this day and age where most of the colleagues are working from home and our admin colleagues are spread like grains of sands everywhere, um, I'm just wondering whether we have the logistical or practical option of sending the DVLA questionnaire in an editable format and via an email route. Just a thought. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I, it's a good question, actually, because we were, we were discussing this um, uh, earlier on this week as uh, in our sort of team meeting and I there's very much the will to move to um, some kind of electronic way of exchanging data because you know clearly that's the way things are moving forward now. Um, ge generally they will accept the forms by email but I don't think there's any current facility for sending them out by email but I know that's something that is um, being looked at you know quite urgently to make to make sure we can adapt to the current way of working so um, at the moment, no, but I, it's definitely something that, that's being looked into. That's great, thanks. Thanks. And Ulrich, you've, you've got an interesting question about uh, positive effects of certainly treatments of a particular mental disorder. Uh, Ulrich müller sedgwick I'm an adult ADHD specialist. So I'm, I'm very pleased to see that the advice for drivers and for clinicians is now in line because the, the, in the past the, there was some discrepancy. Mm -hmm. um, but there is still some kind of semantics, if you like, because it says DVLA has to be informed if there is a change. And what we see in ADHD is actually that patients get better when they are started on ADHD medications. There is evidence from uh, controlled clinical trials so and, and and I guess this uh, the, the the latest version where it says it should, then they will need to be notified about a change it does not include an improvement it it, it should probably be uh, if there's a deterioration of their driving or driving gets worse. Yeah, th thank you for that. I think that's um, that's very helpful. I I'll um, certainly something I'll take back to you know, to to make sure the wording um, is 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 consistent on that because that's an important point because yeah as you say it's only deterioration or concerns that we'd want to know about not you know not people obviously improvement is is absolutely fine so yeah thank you for that I'll, I'll take that back to the team on that one thank you okay um got a question from carolyn who i think is carolyn patterson yes um that's right um uh I'm we had a case of um, a chap with frontotemporal dementia and he was denied the, the right to drive, but he carried on driving and the information that was sent to him, he was very um, cunning and he would wait for the post to arrive and then hide the letters so that his wife and family didn't know that these, uh, this information was coming that revoked his license and he carried on driving. This is a very difficult situation, and I'm wondering if there's any way to ensure that someone other than the person himself knows that the license has been revoked. Yeah, thank you for that question. I, it is something that's been um, that's been sort of raised with us before, and I, I one of the things we're now starting to do. Um, we've we've had some legal advice around it. Is is making sure that we inform and the GP and as any specialists or other professionals involved in the case so that so that they're aware that the, the license has been revoked um, we don't always have consent to do that but um, we, we've now had some advice that even without consent that we're, we, we can do that because it's in the interest of public safety um, so it's just making sure we get that done and um, the, the, what, what, I th what I think is difficult for us is that we can't always inform um, other family members around it. So I think there's a bit of work to do around um, how we approach that. And, and I, I know that's something else that's being looked at, um, you know, because we don't always have consent to do that, but it, it can be important, I think, to make sure that we make people aware. I mean, it used to be, you know, years ago that you had to return your license to DVLA and if you didn't, you'd get the police would turn up at your house and ask for your license. <laughs> But you know, in the in the days of the way things are now, that that certainly isn't uh, <laughs> the possibility. Because even though you are asked to send your license to DVLA, 
um, you know, you know, a lot, a lot of people don't uh, don't do that. So yeah, thank you for that question. That's, uh, thank you. There's a question around uh, delays in um, applications renewals. Um, certainly, that is it, it has been a problem for us, um, and particularly um, the pandemic has had a huge impact on uh, on DVLA. It, it, most of the staff are not able to work from home, and there has been an impact on processing applications renewals, particularly over the last couple of months. Um, and clearly, we try to prioritise key workers, so particularly the group two drivers who, who needed to have their licenses renewed um, to continue their work, so you know, delivery drivers, uh, etc. Um, so there's, I suppose there's some inevitable delays, but I, my advice always would be to just keep on, if patients are reporting you delays, um, just to keep on calling because there is after you've called a number of times to the contact center there is an escalation so I, I that, that would be my advice um, on that one um, and I noticed there's a question about Lewy body um, dementia um, and patients being at risk with the prominent visual spatial deficits um, I think clearly yeah, um, we don't have any specific standards or guidance around Lewy body dementia but again it's it's looking at the the presentation in that particular case um, and clearly if there were any um, visual spatial deficits those often do have an impact on driving and you can often see that in a driving assessment um, where, where those will, will, will be shown so I, that, that is quite relevant uh, in, the, in those kind of cases definitely. I suppose one of the reasons that there are so many clinicians on the call is an important part of the practice, important part of patients' lives, but it's also an area where things can go wrong. Yes. Yeah. Um, what role do you and DVLA have? Well, could you describe the process if, if there is legal redress, someone has an accident? Um, how does that process tend to unroll? Where, you know, is, is the role of the responsible clinician uh, scrutinised? Um, yeah, I, I, I suppose the most prominent um, example of that would have been the, the Glasgow, the, the bin lorry um, mm -hmm. accident in Glasgow, which obviously there, would, there was a, um, a public inquiry around that particular incident. And um, in that respect, DVLA, our, our senior doctor went to the uh, to that case to give evidence in terms of what DVLA's relationship had been with them um, in, in terms of that case. So I, we, we do often get requests. So where there's, where there's been a, some sort of incident, um, the, the police will often take two approaches. So they'll either um, send us a notification related to that driver to say, well, this, this incident has happened uh, and they've got this medical condition, which they haven't declared to DVLA um, and, and we'll investigate that or, so, or sometimes if it's a serious incident they'll approach the police will approach DVLA to ask if the driver has um, uh, notified us of, of their condition. Um, I'm, I'm not really aware of, of how much they would look into into the actual responsible condition in respect to that because the law is very much emphasized around the driver being responsible to notify um, and there's obviously GMC guidance around that but um, I, th I think part of the importance of doing sessions like this is if for us is to make is to you know increasingly make clinicians aware of of what the guidelines are and you know how, how to deal with certain situations I think you know a lot of uh, you know a lot of clinicians are perhaps not fully aware of the guidance. I certainly know from my own practice that you know there were certain areas that I wasn't a hundred percent sure on, and so I think it's it's important to try and get that information um, out there, and probably from an earlier stage, you know, from from medical students, because I don't think there's really a lot of input in that respect as well. I don't know if that really answers your question, but uh, it's certainly some of the thoughts we've had around that. Mm, that's interesting. I simply don't know what we do in terms of the curriculum for students here in driving. Uh, I 
hope that it's addressed in some way because that's across so many disorders, not just mental disorders. Yes. Any other questions or comments? Uh, so I had a question, Peter, if I may. Yeah, Chris. Um, I fill in these forms fairly regularly for people with long-term conditions like schizophrenia and bipolar. Uh, and as I fill them in, I'm always aware that I fill in the medication and dates of last episode and relapses with uh, hospital admissions and so on. And I was wondering if this data ever gets pulled and researched to look at associations between uh, medication and outcome. Mm. Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't. We, we've, I mean, if you think probably the amount of data that DVLA holds that would that on on uh, conditions would be really interesting to look at, and there's a probably you know a huge wealth of information. Um, you know, unfortunately, we we don't do any uh, research, and funding always gets cited as a reason for that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, it's certainly I know certainly myself and a number of my colleagues have um, have have asked to, to be able to do, and certainly something the the psychiatry panel um the sexual states panel were really interested in is trying to get data from insurers around accidents and um you know accident data to try and compare that with uh with, with some of the conditions but we just can't get hold of that data because it, you know, it's considered commercially sensitive um but yeah it is it, i think it's a deficit in, in terms of our um our practice it, you know it would be really useful to have have access to some of that data it was a great talk, really interesting. Um, oh, great, yeah, thank you very much. So can everyone show their appreciation perhaps by turning on their video screens, unmuting and giving a round of applause? Uh, well, thank you very much, that's very, very kind. It's a pleasure to be able to um, talk to you this afternoon. Great. You were the last talk in our season. So uh, I'll see the rest of you back in the autumn. Thanks.